I, uh, it's, uh, it, it's time to go ahead and get started. Uh, so uh, it looks like people are still kind of funneling in. Is everybody ready to go? All right, everybody amped up? Huh? Um, as, as you can see, this is a, a Drupal in a Google AMP world. I grayed out the Google because technically the AMP project is an independent open source project now. And so, you know, despite the fact that it's supposed to be disassociated from Google, uh, I've actually been to a couple of AMP summits and it is only Google people. So, yeah, it's going to be a while before they kind of shake it off. Um, but, uh, in, first, I just want to say thank you very much to everybody uh, for here at, you know, at DrupalCon and uh, for all you attendees, you know, uh, especially here in Vienna. I know this is really going to be like kind of the, the big banana, you know, for Europe. And so I'm, I'm glad that we're able to, uh, uh, to share this together. And I hope that uh, you find some, uh, some value in this talk. Um, I want to let you know that I gave this talk already to the Austin Drupal user group about a week ago. Uh, with lots of direct uh, interactions throughout. It took about 45 to 50 minutes, and so I don't expect this to take the full hour. And so if you guys want to go play afterwards, you'll have plenty of time to do it, most likely. Uh, so first, just want to kind of talk about an overview of the talk and uh, we'll kind of move from there. Um, First, I really want to talk a little bit more about uh, what is AMP, uh, even though we're talking about it in, really kind of in the context of Drupal. Uh, I, I think it's, under, it's important to understand what AMP is um, so that you'll kind of have a, a, an idea of what you're getting into if you uh, don't already know. Uh, next, I want to talk about how AMP will, you know, will make things better for you. Uh, you know, uh, obviously, your mileage may vary, but uh, you know, kind of talk about the, uh, the, the benefits of uh, implementing the technology and uh, the paradigms. Afterwards, I want to talk a little bit more about uh, what's involved uh, with the, you know, making your Drupal instance AMP ready. Um, you know, we'll talk about uh, things like the theme and things like the current module, but uh, there's a lot of other um, items that, you know, just implementing AMP is one thing. It's kind of uh, what's going to happen afterwards, right? The impacts it's going to have on uh, your, your web properties that uh, you know, we're going to talk a little bit about. And then after that, uh, you know, we'll, we'll kind of open it up for uh, questions and discussions necessary. Uh, so, uh, first, you know, really, what is AMP? Okay, um, uh, you know, AMP stands for Accelerated Mobile Pages. And, uh, you know, there's really three components, but uh, what I think people kind of leave out is the fact that AMP is really more principles than technology. Um, you know, we'll talk about those principles. We'll talk about AMP HTML, which is what is ultimately, you know, assembled for an AMP page and, uh, you know, reflects a, an instance. Uh, next, we'll talk about AMP.js, right, which is, uh, you know, really the, uh, the backbone of AMP. It's, uh, after that, we'll talk a lot more about the, uh, the AMP cache itself and, uh, you know, what that means in terms of uh, the AMP offering as a whole. Uh, but I highly encourage you, if you want to learn anything about AMP, to go to the ampproject.org. They do a much better job than I do explaining what this stuff is right and how it works. So uh, all the answers to your questions could be answered there. Um, and they have a really handy contact us at the very bottom so you can reach directly out to the people uh, and they will be more than happy to, uh, uh, to work with you. Uh, so principles, principles first. What they really want to focus on is how the user experience is greater than the developer experience, right? And so uh, that's even more important than the ease of implementation. And so there are some, some nuances, some quirks, some difficulties behind AMP that uh, a lot of developers feel. But ultimately, it's all about user experience, right? We're talking about speed. We're talking about reliability, you know? And sometimes you're just going to have to kind of swallow the, you know, the pill, you know, to make it work. Um, and uh, for, for those of you that are involved with web optimization and web performance, um, oftentimes it can be a pretty hairy battle, right? Just to squeeze half a second out of your website, especially if uh, it's been, it's the grand summary or result of, of years of, uh, of bad practices or just kind of uh, compromises you may have made uh, against your better judgment. Um, so, you know, that's really what it's all about is the user experience. Um, 
you know, only do things if they can be made fast. And that's, that's really what's key. Uh, you'll find that there are a lot of uh, components, a lot of tags, a, a lot of uh, uh, facilities that are provided by the AMP project. But I want, you, I want you to understand that the reason that they built those was that it was focused around the performance profile. Right? And so if they implemented, say, like a Facebook tag or some kind of uh, a widget like, um, uh, like slides, right, for instance, that's, that they only did that because they could make it fast and it was you know, uh, in line with their, their principles for speed. And then once again, you know, the focus on the, the user experience is that you know, that sh stuff should be prioritized, but you, know, you can compromise when needed. Um, now, what's, what's interesting about this principle is it, you know, it kind of contradicts with, with certain aspects of AMP, and we'll, we'll talk a little bit more about that in a moment here. But um, again, user experience, speed, that's what really the, the goal. So, AMP HTML. Uh, you know, it is HTML, but it has some restrictions. Um, you know, you can usually um, identify AMP HTML pretty quickly by knowing that it's, you'll usually see this really sweet little lightning bolt or the word AMP actually in the tag, but that's the number one indicator. Starts with the first thing to say, like, this is AMP HTML, right? Um, there is no external CSS in AMP HTML, which I think is really worth pointing out. You can't include a style sheet, which is, uh, you know, where some of the pain can be felt, right? And most people are just, oh, yeah, you know, style sheet, right? No, that, that's, that's not the way it works with AMP HTML. Uh, we'll talk a little bit more about that here in a moment, but uh, you have to embed all of your CSS, your custom CSS, in the head of the document and there's a limit to how much you can actually put in there to maintain performance characteristics. Um, and then, there, of course, there are the full sa tag substitutions to make sure that everything is performant, right? So a good example of that is the AMP image tag. Um, I, you know, for, for brevity, I didn't put uh, all the various uh, attributes that are required, but for instance, on an AMP image, you have to have uh, width and height. And that's so that when you know the, the page is rendered and it draws out, it will know the dimensions in advance so that it can build the page out correctly. And that's part of the, the, the speed requirements. Uh, so again, it's HTML, but there's some restrictions. And you know, um, while I won't talk about a lot of those restrictions for the individual tags here, again, uh, the AMP project will give you everything you need to know and a justification for it as well. Uh, so this is what an AMP document, a very minimal document, will look like. Um, a couple of things I want to point out. You don't have the lightning bolt in this one. They decided to go with just AMP here. But uh, some of the things that are very important to point out is how this script right here is very early in the document, right? Um, also notice that it's async, so even though it's early, it's, it's still getting a, a certain level of priority. Uh, there's this schema, which uh, helps for the identification of of the types of content, especially when it comes to indexing and uh, you know presenting that information back in search results, stuff's pretty important. As is this viewport, as is this canonical uh, link right here, and um, you know uh, that stuff is all described for what's um, you know what it's used for. And then lastly, there's this boilerplate, which is a lot of the, uh, the animation overrides to make sure that uh, you know how things are rendered are are, are somewhat normalized. Uh, there's a really interesting explanation about it on the uh, on the website if you guys want to know a little bit more about it. But after that, you kind of just go and you can start adding to the body as you normally would. So AMP.js. Uh, I, I want to make it very clear. AMP, it's a part of AMP. It, it, it's not a custom dev framework, right? It's not like React or Angular or, or jQuery or something like that. It's It comes back to this include right here. And so what, what happens is uh, you bring it in, and it ensures that you get the fast rendering of AMP HTML pages. And it does that by loading all resources on the page asynchronously based on the tags, the sources of the various tags that you've got. Um, and it also carries the definitions of all those custom elements, right? So AMP image, AMP Twitter, stuff like that. Um, it knows how to do, how to interpret those. It knows how to render those. It knows how to make it all all wired together, and it's it all runs just by virtue of being included in the page. Um, you know, it implements the conventions, but it, 
what's even more important is that it implements the validation. And so uh, uh, just briefly, I want to talk about how AMP documents can be validated against the rules, the principles behind it. And that's amazing because, uh, how, show of hands, how many of you validate your HTML? Ah, about half. Do you do it automatically? Ah, even fewer. So you guys are, you know, the few, <laughs> right? <laughs> Right, and so with AMP, it's, it's nice because validation is just really an integral part of it. It wants to make sure that you're conforming to the conventions to make sure you keep those, those, uh, those performance characteristics. If you go and throw just, you know, big images or you throw too, many, too much HTML or you include uh, render blocking uh, components, right, it, it, it will yell at you. And so that, that validation is, is really critical. You can use it for your needs, but uh, Google will validate your documents and it will, it will penalize you if it's, they're, they're not valid. So again, this, it's all about that include up there in the, in the blue. Um, you just bring it in and you can use it and that's, that's you know, it's just part of your standard uh, boilerplate uh, document. So AMP cache. That's really kind of the unsung hero of AMP in, in my personal opinion. You know, you build a document, you include the JavaScript, you make it all validate and it's all good, but what about um, you know, the speed of your page as it relates to the user's location? If you're hosting it from, you know, from one data center, right? it's, only, it's still only gonna be as fast as that connection. Well, AMP Cache is a facility that's provided um, CDN, right? And it will deliver all valid AMP documents once it's actually been identified and indexed. And that's huge. That way you don't, you know, it will deliver it for you. It will deliver it instantly as part of search results. And so it, it sits in front, right? Um, and allows for things to maintain their performance over the network as opposed to just the document itself. And that's, that's really huge. And, you know, it guarantees your performance right, across the globe. You know, I, I, um, for websites that I run, you know, it's, it's, it's tricky trying to run a distributed application, right, in, in multiple geographies and maintain a, a high level of performance. And so it's nice to know that you kind of have this, uh, this CDN that's provided that kind of automatically keeps things fast for you. Uh, but the key is that it only will store valid documents and so it performs validation uh, for you, right, and it, and it will uh, kind of enforce the rules. And so that's kind of nice, but it's also kind of a difficult to work with in some ways. But if you're going to use AMP, I mean, why not take advantage of the AMP cache? I mean, it's, they've built it and they've provided it for you, right? And it, and it just really uh, ensures that performance. Um, and then in some ways, too, it also goes above and beyond because the AMP cache is all HTTP2 and it leverages the performance characteristics of HTTP2, such as, uh, you know, uh, you know, compression for headers, stuff like that, right, where it will keep things fast and it knows how to do so in the context of AMP documents. And so that's nice from, from a, you know, from an ops perspective where um, if you haven't implemented HTTP2, as long as you are delivering an AMP document and is able to be cached by the AMP cache, you can get HTTP2 benefits without doing anything to your existing infrastructure. Um, and here's the best part, it's free. Right? And I know we all like free. No? Yes? Okay. So, how will AMP make things better for you? Um, well, first, I, 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 as you can see about the principles, it's really all about the user experience, right? And I think that every, all of us like fast pages, right? And as long as there's um, a, a, a principled discipline that allows you to have fast pages, that will be relatively minimal in terms of complexity, then you know, you're guaranteeing yourself a, a better user experience, right? Um, you know, it is reduced complexity. You know, if you've got a ton of CSS on your website, that's a complex website. Not only is it gonna be slow, but it's gonna be difficult to maintain, right? I mean, who in here likes CSS and likes fighting with CSS all day? Who here has websites that's got 10,000 lines of CSS? Okay, yeah, yeah, that's complexity, okay, right? 
Uh, more consistency. I mean, I think that you're going to find that as long as you are producing reliably uh, consistent AMP documents, right, that are valid, you're going to get a consistent performance. If you're using AMP cache, you're going to get consistent response times, right? And so you're not going to be subject to, uh, you know, the effects of response times, especially for averages where, say, somebody uh, accesses your website from a, a, a country that's got, uh, you know, a, a slow internet connection your averages get, get dragged up, right? Because even though it may be fast in, say, like the United States or in Europe, it may not be all that fast in, uh, say, like Africa or to uh, something like Australia, right? And so that you get that better consistency with something like AMP cache. Um, now, as far as the, the, the better user experience, again, you know, you get that mobile first profile. Um, you know, the, the validation does improve the reliability of your pages. The better interactions with the AMP components is really important. Not only are they insured to operate quickly, but they're insured to operate, right? Which is huge, right? They're going to provide you things like the slideshow or the Facebook integration or the analytics integration, and they have vetted that not only does it perform, but that it actually operates. And so instead of you writing your own custom implementation, which may be subject to break, right? You know, you're using proven, reliable components. Um, now, in terms of reduced complexity, this comes back to the limits on CSS. You know, you only get 50K of CSS, right? And so you're going to really have to choose, right, and what you want to build and how, how complex you want things to look. And, and I think that's important, especially um, when it comes to the balance between a UX and design and development, right, having some constraints. Because oftentimes, you know, speaking for myself as uh, has, having filled both roles, but being, uh, you know, dominantly dev, you know, you know, that I can get crazy requests coming in with just tons of CSS or something that's going to require so much CSS, right, or, or just really complicated CSS to achieve something, and then it may not work in all browsers and all. It's, it, it's just really nice to have to operate with some level of constraint. You know, only the AMP elements are supported, right? So it guarantees that performance. And so you're not going to have the burden of building anything or you're not going to have such uh, the chore of, say, going out across the web and looking for some kind of turnkey component for something like a slideshow right, or something, right? At least you know that you're, you're getting it from a, a pre-vetted list that's already ready to go. And then, you know, those principles and docs provide good guidance and con context, right? And so as you've got developers, you know, a developer team, and then they're all trying to produce an AMP document, right, and they're all referring to the same documentation and they're all operating under the same principles, you're going to get, you know, a lot more understanding amongst them and agreement, which I think is really important, uh, especially if you have, say, like a distributed team. Now, uh, again, the CD CDN does improve that global and device consistency. And I, I think that that's, that's really important. You know, you want to know if your, your website's fast no matter where you're at, right? So that, that consistency is huge, and that's a big benefit to why, uh, you, know, what, you know, what AMP does for you. Um, you know, that validation of documents does inform that, uh, enforce that consistent profile, right? Uh, again, it's a valid document, so I know it will be fast, right? And then I know it will be consistent. Um, that consistent development, once again, is, is just huge. You know, having developers all on the same page is, is a big one. And being able to take away, you know, the opinions of, from, say, senior developers versus junior developers, right? And then being able to point back to this one single kind of source of truth about how documents are supposed to be formed and, and, and operate, that's, that's a big benefit, right? I mean, you know, think about it, right? How many arguments have you seen, right, of just semantics of CSS or HTML? I mean, I've seen lots, okay? And then with uh, the divide of, uh, you know, traditional HTML versus things like HTML5, I mean, I've seen arguments about the article tag, right? It's, it's, it's time to overcome that stuff and get a little bit more consistent. So what's involved with making your Drupal instance AMP ready? Uh, so I really want to talk a little bit more about the AMP contrib module that's out there right now. Uh, I'm going to talk also uh, briefly about the AMP uh, contributed theme. But then I want to talk a little bit more about the analytics. And there's not really, 
uh, anything that's turnkey or specific to Drupal per se when it comes to the analytics. But I think that it's important to point out what's going to happen once you've got AMP pages out in the wild and, you know, how you're going to try to address those things. Um, you know, running them from your, your, your not only your, your instance, but also the, the, the broader web property as a whole. Um, so, the AMP contrib module. Here's the URL. If it, I, you know, it's pretty easy to look up, but it's there for your, for your reference. Um, I want to point out that you, you need to make sure that your website is governed by, you know, a, a composer-based installation because it requires the Lullabot AMP library. Um, the AMP library is, is really quite fascinating. Uh, what it will do is it will take HTML as an input, rewrite it into AMP HTML, and spit it out, right? And so there's a lot of magic that's happening there, right? And so it, that's really good for, say, like WYSIWYG content where you've got embedded images or, or whatever have you. Uh, but at the same time, I want to I point out that it is rewriting, you know, your output kind of without your knowledge, right, or control, right? It's just this kind of, you know, crazy uh, format output. Um, it does provide uh, all the different configurations you can have for a Drupal instance in terms of uh, AMP readiness. Uh, it provides a variety of, of uh, display modes or, or view modes, and it provides the, de the different text formats that'll be required uh, to make sure you're outputting valid AMP. Um, and that really kind of ties in uh, these text formats and the AMP library kind of go hand in hand. And then it also handles um, other uh, elements as well. Now the theme, you know, you would think that the theme would be responsible for most of the actual HTML tag implementations, uh, but it's not. The, the module does quite a bit of it. For example, the AMP analytics tag, uh, it will embed that tag for you based on the presence of a value, uh, um, you know, uh, of an actual configuration value. And so, it does a lot of the heavy lifting for you. Um, and because it does that, it may not necessarily provide all of the features or functionality you need. So like AMP Analytics is a good example of where you might need to do something specific, but it's just got one single configuration that will embed that tag for you. And so uh, depending on the, the level of complexity of your website, you might find that the AMP contrib module is helpful only to a certain extent. You might actually need to implement quite a bit on your own depending on your needs. Um, what will happen is you will activate the, app, uh, the, uh, the module and then you will need to specify a theme and then you will need to create an alternative view mode for each of your content types and then you will need to go to each of your fields and then you will need to apply a text format and when it's all said and done you will have a duplicate version of your page that should be AMP compliant and you can access it by simply adding the AMP query parameter to the end of your document uh, and end of your URL and so um, for the uh, the, the f idea that you actually have to have two versions of your website, right? There's the standard version and the AMP version. This kind of enforces that paradigm. Now, now I, I can tell you now that, uh, in my opinion, you don't have to have two versions of your website. Now, I, I think when it comes to Drupal, it's kind of forced if you're going to use the contrib version or the contrib solutions. But, you know, one of the principles, and I didn't really talk about it here, is that AMP shouldn't break things, and that should be the last thing it does. It's HTML with restrictions. And so, uh, for instance, my website, you know, is an AMP website. There's only one version. It's AMP. It loads great. It loads great on every browser, and I don't have any issues with it, right? And so, uh, but then again, it's manually curated HTML. It's not an actual Drupal site. And so, I'm able to get away with that. Um, so I want to point out that, you know, once again, that the AMP URLs go to the AMP view mode for a content type. And so if you've got two dozen content types, you're going to have two dozen view modes that you're going to have to go configure, and that could be a bit of a chore, right? Um, hopefully, um, depending on the complexity of your website, only some content types would be in scope. I would hate to think that you would have to go do this for all of your content types, right? And, you know, it's, it can be tricky, especially if you've all, if some of your content types 
already have multiple view modes, say like a teaser versus the default, right? Well then you would, would you need an amp teaser and an amp default? You know, and then so at that point it almost forces like doubling up. Um, you know, and again that, that library can rewrite the HTML via, you know, the field format. And that's, you know, I think it's worth pointing out as a word of caution. However, we, you know, we use Drupal to rewrite our output all the time. So I don't think that, you know, I don't, I don't think we, there's any point in being kind of hypocritical about it, right? Token replacement's a good example. Stripping um, tags that are not allowed in, a, in some field, right? It, it, we already kind of do that, so we should feel relatively comfortable. Just know that it's not Drupal that's doing it, it's a composer package that's doing it. And so, I think it's worth uh, pointing out. So, that was really the module and what you would get from the module itself. Then there's the theme. And you, despite the fact that you can install the module w without the theme, you won't get any kind of output. So you have to install the theme. Here's the URL for your, for your reference. So, it will come, it comes out of the box with a base theme, then it comes with an example theme. The base theme cannot be set as like the default for your website. It will totally explode and I highly recommend against it. But you can also specify a theme in the module, right, which will be a sub theme, but you can't specify the base theme. And so it's a little tricky. Um, you know, and that's really kind of what this line talks about, how it can't be the default for the AMP configs. And so, if you're going to actually go down this route, you have to implement a sub theme, right? And so that's, there, there's some work there. You can't, it, it, it's not quite as turnkey as you might hope it is, where you just beep, bop, boop, you know? Um, unless you want to use the example theme, and even then that's only going to take you so far, right? And so, uh, you know, understand that there is a level of commitment that's going to be, uh, need to be applied if you're going to go down this route. Um, that's the example uh, sub-theme, you know, and it, the good thing about it is that it does work and you can, you know, use it to see kind of an example of how things w will work and it does provide guidance in terms of the, the actual code, what, what the twig files should look like, what the, uh, the configurations of the app, uh, the sub-theme should look like. So it, it's helpful, but it only goes so far. It's really just a base theme. That, that you're going to be obligated to, to extend. Um, next is really going to be focused on these analytics. What happens to your analytics? What happens in the, in the world, right, when, once this is out there? Um, first off, you, you have to use AMP specific analytics and add tags, very much like you have to have AMP ready image tags or uh, social media tags, whatever have you. Um, that's a good thing. There are really two versions of it. There's uh, AMP Pixel and AMP Analytics. Uh, AMP Pixel is really uh, quite, quite neat. If you just need to do page views, if you're not doing anything you know, sophisticated with your analytics, AMP Pixel is great, poof. It's just this little tiny pixel. It loads up uh, instantly and it, it tracks your page views against uh, measurement protocols. And it's, it's very lightweight. But if you need to do something a little bit more sophisticated, say like, uh, uh, if somebody completes a form, you want to track some kind of event, you would leverage AMP Analytics and uh, some of its protocols uh, to perform uh, those types of operations. E-commerce tracking is another good example of, uh, of the kinds of things you would need to do uh, with the AMP Analytics uh, counterpart. Um, so, regardless of which implementation you use, AMP manages a client ID for your browser. And I want to point out how, like, really awesome that is, that they did that for us. Um, and that really comes down to the fact that if you're using an AMP cache, your website's going to be served from URLs that are not your domain. And so wouldn't those be duplicate page views? Wouldn't that be another property? Wouldn't that, those be other sessions? Well, AMP overcomes that by governing the client ID that's used in identifying all of your, your tracks and your measurement. It does that for you automatically, and that's just one of those things that, you know, you have to kind of get into the docs to, to figure out, but it's a huge accommodation that they just kind of baked in. And another reason why you want to make sure you, you conform to the, uh, 
uh, the different tags that they provide. So you will get the impact on URLs. At the very least, if you're going to go coming out of Drupal, you're going to get the AMP, you know, a query parameter, and so you would see that in measurement reports unless you have some kind of filters, right, pulling that out. Um, but you do have the, the cache URLs versus the, the domain URLs. So uh, here's an example of, what, uh, of CNN, right, which has AMP articles. When you do the search and you see an article and you click on it, this is the URL that will be in the URL bar, right? And so who gets the credit for that page view, right? How do you, know, you know, what, how do you know that people are even hitting your website? You know, they're not. They're, they're hitting it from cache under a different URL. But if you're using the AMP analytics tags correctly, it will automatically know that it wants to use, it actually wants to attribute the page view against this part, portion of the URL and not google.com. How are you getting a bunch of google.com, you know, page views? Right? So it will overcome all that stuff for you. And again, I, I want to make sure everybody understands that this is, these are the implications that you're going to be fighting once this is out in the wild. Um, luckily, they have a lot of baked in solutions for you. So that's really it. Again, I said this was going to be relatively quick and easy, right? I didn't want to overload you with too much text on the screen. Um, but um, that, that's, that's really it in a nutshell. Um, and, and any questions? Any, everybody, you, know, you guys are just so alive. <laughs> and please. Yes. Uh, quick question about uh, validation. So when you sure. update your content, like how does that get spread back to the cache, like Google's cache? Um, um, th th that's a good question. So if you update content, um, it, your server should deliver headers that indicate that it's been modified. And then the next time it tries to, to pull it up, it should see that there's a, a conflict between the, the last modified date, right? And then it, it should uh, automatically update it for you. It's, it's not really any different than the operation of, say, like, uh, like Akamai, right? Or, uh, or Varnish, for that matter, right? Any kind of uh, edge kind of cache. And so it, it, it does honor those, those kind of conventions. And so, yeah, yeah, n nothing new, nothing new there. Um, any other questions? Has, has anyone implemented an app site? Yeah? Is, uh, am, I, uh, am, am I being truthful here, guys? <laughs> you don't think so? <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> Please. Hi. Uh, for, for an AMP implementation, how do you handle pages for which an AMP version exists? but they have been accessed directly from the browser or from some, you know, through the navigation of the website and not through the Google search results? Are you kind of forcing the AMP version to the user or you will serve, let's say, a responsive version, a responsive mobile version to the mobile device? That's a good question. So let's, let's go look at the, um, th this area over here. If we go into the guides, let's see here. There's a, a section that really covers like the, uh, let's see here. Here we go, discovery. So you'll have the AMP HTML version described in a link and then you'll have the canonical version. And so the, what will happen is your search results will see that you've got these alternative versions linked in your document and it will want to present the AMP version for you, right? But the canonical that you've specified is always the original document. And so unless, uh, unless folks are going directly to that URL or you are linking to that URL, it, it should be just the same website. Does that answer your question or? So uh, I'll rephrase it. Um, in, in, in our context, we are only enabling a subset of the website for AMP, not everything. Mm -hmm. So let's say a user from a mobile device would go into the home page of the website, and then through the navigation of the website, it will land onto a page for which AMP exists. Okay. So right now, there is no mechanism for the browser to understand that that page is also AMP enabled and to get the AMP version instead. 
So unless you're coming from the Google search results or some other websites like LinkedIn or whatever they are fetching from the Google CDN, there is no right. automatic mechanism to say, okay, there is an AMP version for this page, take the AMP version instead. So that, that was my question. I, I understand. I, that, that's, uh, to me, that sounds kind of like a specific use case, right, because it's a subset of your pages and you've got a menu. Um, I would look at maybe, eh, just off the top of my head, something like, uh, you know, a device, you know, uh, interpreting the user's device to see if they are a mobile user and if they are a mobile user, uh, use context to provide an alternative version of the menu that, that picks up the links for the, the pages where that is an option, something like that. Um, it, it could be that it's either the user's device or it also could be the, the viewport width, right, which would just, you know, kind of imply that it was an app document. Uh, but that's, uh, yeah, that, it, that sounds like that's kind of an individual use case uh, overall um, because the devices themselves aren't looking for, um, you know, uh, mobile page options. Now, that may not be, that may not be true in the future. Um, I could see that if a user, say on like an, a on an Android device, is using the Chrome mobile browser, it, it could very easily interpret these link tags and then automatically, you know, you wouldn't have to modify your menu. The theory is that if you went to a page and as it was loading, it encountered the link tag early in the head and it saw that an app HTML counterpart existed, it could then redirect temporarily to load that page. And I, and I think that that would be a fair feature I don't know that uh, I, I would want it to be something I could disable, <laughs> right? I don't know that forcing it would be a good idea, especially if, say, um, because it's a separate version, it's not beyond the realm of reason for, for somebody with an existing website to want to be adapting it for AMP compatibility, but it's not, like, official yet. And then if it started going to AMP pages that are not fully fleshed out yet and they're kind of broken, I, you know, it could be, uh, it could be problematic. Um, and you would want to make sure that it, you you know you hobbled that kind of functionality um, uh, word out there. But uh, does does that answer your question a little bit better? Great. Um, any other questions? Any any stories? Yes, my question would be: um, Well, this is for anonymous users, right? To cache all the sites anonymous users uh, can see. But what happens if a user is logged in with a Chrome, a Chrome browser and is coming to Google, searching for something, finding the AMP, what version will be displayed for him? Um, that's, that's, a good, that's a good question. So it needs to be a valid document, right? And so as long as you are telling, you are making the pages discoverable, right, to, to <coughs> Google, you're, in, you're indicating to Google, I want you to see these, these alternative versions. Does, does, does that make sense? Um, uh, maybe, maybe I didn't. Maybe uh, with, with a little example. Yeah, please. You have? No, um, uh, if you have an example. Oh, um, on this? Well, well, so, you know, let's, uh, let's see here. To, to repeat the question, just so I, I understand completely. Mm -hmm. how, how is it that if um, if a user com goes to search results, that you can indicate to Google to serve AMP as the results? No? Uh, right. 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 All right, Correct. so I'm never logged in with the AMP and I see the cached one from Google. Right, yeah, yes. Go okay, Google right. won't give it to you unless you're on a mobile device. But you also have to have this discoverability, right? Like Google has to also know that it can give you an AMP uh, alternative if you're on the, the right kind of device. All right. Yeah, I think the question was to say that I log into the Google site. Okay.
That's interesting. Um, but I don't, I don't think that Google would be involved with the personalization. But if we were to use, uh, if, if there were like dynamic content, let's go in here. Let's go look, look at the reference, for example. Like dynamic content. Yeah, let's go here. So if it were like a, like a web push or some kind of like user notification, just as an example, right? That that would still be, that would still be part of the the device session, right? I mean, the the, the default page that's delivered by, you know, by AMP Cache or by your site is still going to be generic, right? Unless unless you actually have Drupal doing the assembly of the personalized content, right? Like, are, would that if that content's loading asynchronously on the client based on like uh, some kind of reverse IP lookup, which I would I would recommend, right? Then it, it wouldn't matter which version you're loading. But if it's Drupal that's doing, you know, if it's a, a server side uh, perspective, then yeah, then that, that would be tricky because you wouldn't want it to cache, right? Because it would be personalized. Right, right, out of cash. Yeah, that, that would be the, uh, the, how it's loading from that one URL. Yeah, if, if it's coming, even if you're logged into the website, if you do a search result for the same website and you're getting an AMP search result that's valid and in the cache, yeah, you're, it's not gonna hit your website whatsoever. It's gonna load it all straight out of the cache and not just the page, but all of the components as well. So right. images and all that. Another question: um, How is it about other search engines like Bing? How did they implement it already? Maybe. Um, I, I'm not sure if if, if, um, if Bing has is honoring the AMP project. I would assume that I would assume that they're not, right? I mean, it's it's Microsoft. They always kind of go their own way, right? You know. Um, but I, I, to my knowledge, uh, uh, Bing does not. Um, uh, deliver from like search results that are in the AMP caches or anything like that. Uh, but that's that's just to my knowledge. I haven't spent that much time on it to be uh, completely honest. So. All right. Thank you. Cool. Thank you so much for the questions. Hi, I'm Daniel. Hi. I work Hi. with in sales in a company in Norway. We uh, focus on the media. Okay. Uh, so this is more of a sales question. Okay. I guess. Uh, first of all. Um, do you have any good numbers in terms of the results on the other side for the customer? Do you have any uh, very satisfied customers uh, that you well, can show to? So, yeah, I mean, customers, you know, I, it's very anecdotal, right? But cause, as long as it feels fast to them, right, that's the real big one. But, you know, not from my own personal stories, but I can at least refer to the recent incident where AMP ads were having problems, and they were a lot slower than the, the non-AMP counterparts. And so some major websites that were leveraging AMP pulled out because of the impacts in advertising revenues, and Google had to directly do, uh, you know, uh, uh, make some changes and work with the AMP project to, to overcome yeah, those. Yeah, I, I think that was covered in yesterday. Yeah, yeah, it, uh, he, so yeah he had mentioned really about fast. that. Yeah. yeah, so that would be, those would be the, the, the areas where that would make sense, um, but I mean, it, the justifications for the for the speed, right? I, I would, I was actually recommend maybe looking at some of these use cases or these case studies here, like Washington Post or all that, right? Yeah, and they'll they'll give you a little bit more concrete aspects. Um, cool. In terms Second of question. So now, once you did it a couple of times, I guess, mm -hmm. uh, how much time does your team have to spend on it to implement one site? Uh, it depends on the implementation, right? So, and I'm sorry to, to, to dodge on that, but if you're gonna have two versions of the website yep. and you're gonna do it through Drupal, it might take longer than if you're just building an AMP-only version of a website, you yep. know? And so it, it just really depends on the scope and what the, what the desired outcome is. And, you know, the, the schema stuff, um, and this was covered in the one yesterday, that there's only, the, the schema only covers news articles, recipes, and, uh, oh, geez, I forget the, the last one, but, you know, 
as long as it's a really like a news centric article, kind of a website, then you're going to get even more benefits, right? Versus if it's just using AMP technology to ensure a certain performance profile, but it's more of a traditional website that's you know, brochure website or whatever have you. I mean, you're just going to really get the, the, the speed benefits, but you're not necessarily going to get indexed articles, right? And so um, it's, it's really, a, it, it just depends on the context and the level of complexity, right? If you're really trying to, to leverage the, the max functionality, it's going to take a little bit longer. Um, but once you've done it a few times, you know what you're, what's going on. It's, it's not too bad. Yeah. It's still are we talking HTML. a couple of hours or are we talking a couple of days or a couple of weeks? Um, well, um, here's a good example. On, on my personal website, I converted it to AMP HTML in like 90 minutes. Yeah. Yeah. It didn't take very long at all. But then again, I had a simple website, right? So it, your mileage may vary, right? It just, it just depends on the, on the size of the site and, and what it is that you're building. If it's using a content management framework, if it's Drupal, it, it, it could be a little bit more hairy. Yeah. Definitely. Okay, thanks. Great. Thank you. Hi, where do you stand in terms of the objections that people have in terms of uh, intellectual property because you're just giving away your website to Google? Are there options to take it down if you want to take it down? Uh, does Google always do the updates whenever you instruct the updates to happen? Where do you stand on that? What's your personal opinion? Because I get a lot of backlash. I just took a, a picture and tweeted it, your slide deck, and I'm awaiting backlash as we speak. <laughs> um, you know, I, I got to be completely honest. I give up, you know, yeah. really <laughs> take it. There's no fighting it, right? I mean, you know, I, I'm from the States. The NSA inspects everything I do, and there's just no way around it. And so but, but, it's not. But the pra in practical terms, right, like getting changes to happen, taking your own website down yeah, because you, you want to shut something down. Yeah, versus what's removing cached. a page. Yeah, removing a page that might not be the one you wanted there. Yeah. Um, I say if you put it on the internet, you do so at your own yeah. risk, yeah. you know? Um, and then wanting to take it down, I mean, eh, that's tricky. If, you, you know, if you're implementing something and you're going to leverage AMP cache, it seems, in, in my opinion, you are, you know, voluntarily putting it out there, right? Yeah. It's, you've kind of made that decision in advance, and if you want to take it down. Well, personally, I fell for the hype, and I, I installed the plugin, and I have my AMP working for me. But I hadn't really thought it through. So yeah, the we'll implications, see in the, in the yeah. Happened. But then Google is promoting uh, another kind of similar websites, which is progressive web apps, which share mm -hmm. a lot of the yeah. same ideas. Or web, web amps. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Um, again, it's, you know, prudence goes a long way, <laughs> right? Um, you know, it, it's, it, I think it's worth taking advantage of it um, and, and just kind of uh, uh, living with it. But, you know, if you can implement AMP without being, without the AMP cache, right? And so if there's any doubt about, you know, wanting to pull something down or deal with the repercussions, then maybe you might just want to avoid discoverability and cacheability in general. And just go for the best practices in terms of performance. Yeah, exactly. And so that way, if they are hitting your back end, at least you're just giving a very minimal response that's going to have a performance uh, profile. So. That's, that's my stance. Um, we, we can talk more about it afterwards. Thank like, you. Yeah, you got it. So, um, well, we've got, uh, let's see here. It's been about 50 minutes, which is almost exactly as long as it took when I was at, in Austin, which is awesome. Um, but, yeah, I mean, that's, that's really all it. So um, thank you all so much for your time today, and I hope you all have a fantastic rest of the con. Um, I had, uh, just as a really quick plug, if any of you really like breakfast, or cakes or teas. There's an amazing little cafe that's a short walk from here called Little Britain that is just awesome. They have afternoon tea with sandwiches. I mean, they got all kinds of cool stuff, right? And so just my little recommendation for uh, kind of some of the local fare. There's also another place called Icky's. Now, I don't know how often I recommend a place called Icky's, right? But it's right around the corner, and apparently they bring you a plate of meat that's grilled and that's it it's just like this overwhelming amount of meat and um, it's supposed to be really good and it's just like right over there so if you guys are looking for some fun local lunch action uh, those are my recommendations to you so thanks again guys <laughs>